The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The U.S. Constitution. The 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified August 18, 1920. It states that American women cannot be denied the right to vote just because of their gender. Although this right seems natural and obvious to us now, it was not easily gained. The American women's suffrage movement has a long and vast history with untold thousands of people working for over a century to ensure equal voting rights for women. Its story did not end in 1920. In fact, its story is not yet done. And this is a quote from Votes for Women, Leaders of the Suffrage Movement flashcards. Welcome back listeners to For the Love of History. Today, I have two fabulous fellow history grad students with me to help in talking about one of my favorite history topics, the women's suffrage movement in the US. But first, now that I have your attention, just a quick reminder to you to pause this episode and just quickly like, subscribe, and share my podcast. So I want to begin by giving a little bit um, to the listeners about how we know each other. So we know each other through college. We signed up for a New York Study Away program taught and hosted by two fabulous professors, Professor Dilly and Professor Peterson. Um, and the point of the course and trip to New York was to become educated on some of the earliest supporters and activists for social justice in the U.S., like Matilda Jocelyn Gage and Susan B. Anthony. Though the focus was on the women's suffrage movement and abolition and the influence um, of the Haudenosaunee Indians, um, the influence that they had on women's suffrage in the 19th uh, in 19th century New York. So before we begin, I have Madeline here with me. Um, Ever's running a little late, but she can catch up with us when she gets here. <laughs> um, so Madeline, tell us a little bit about what you're going to school for and what your focus will be after grad school. Thank you, I'm glad to be here, Jennifer. Um, I am in the master's history program at UTSA. I started in the summer with our New York study away trip. Um, and I'm hoping to go into a PhD after I graduate at some point, either in history or maybe something more specialized like American Studies or Indian Studies. But um, here at UTSA, I plan to do the thesis track. Nice. And, yes. Um, I'm very interested in Indigenous history. So I'm hoping that my thesis can revolve around that in some way. And that was also part of what really uh, drew my curiosity about our women's suffrage class was mm -hmm. there's this indigenous thread with the Haudenosaunee that I took some deep dive into in some other readings in addition to what we read for class where I got a little different perspective that hopefully I can share about today. Interesting. Well, that sounds exciting. All righty. Well, I know you're going to do great. Um, with your thesis, um, it's one of the reasons why I have you here. You just know how to talk. You know how to explain. And that's what I love about you. <laughs> so I know you're going to do great. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned earlier, we met in Professor Dilly's and Professor Peterson's New York Study Away program, which I absolutely enjoyed. Um, it was so educational. I got so much research out of it. And it was like, walking in Susan B. Anthony's shoes and Harriet Tubman and Matilda Jocelyn Gage's shoes and many more people that we learned about. And so um, for all of you guys listening back home, um, we stayed at a beautiful college, the Hobart William Smith College in Geneva, New York. And we traveled to Rochester, Auburn, Seneca Falls, Victor, and Syracuse. And we learned a lot about location-based learning and research and the different ways um, history is told and connecting the past to the present um, and also the different careers we could have with a history degree and more. So Madeline, I know you mentioned your um, interest in the Haudenosaunee um, community um, and I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. Um, if you can tell us a little bit more. 
about my interest in the Haudenosaunee community. Yes. Um, well, we actually went to a couple of places in New York that were pertinent to this mm -hmm. um, Scan and Doe Center, mm -hmm. which is run by the Onondaga Nation, and also the Ganondagon Center or historical site, which is run by some Seneca people. And um, at the Scan and Doe Center, they actually have some little exhibits about one of the suffragists we learned about, Matilda yes. Jocelyn Gage. She was actually uh, honorarily adopted into the Mohawk tribe, the Wolf Clan, mm -hmm. the Mohawk tribe. And we read some of her uh, writings in Sally Roche Wagner's anthology, The Women's Suffrage Movement. Mm -hmm. um, and Gage seemed to be kind of like ahead of her time, maybe. And she was really trying to be an ally to indigenous people. And in our class, we read from Sally Roche Wagner's anthology, The Women's Suffrage Movement, a couple of uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage's writings that exemplify what uh, Wagner wants to portray as a kind of allyship to indigenous peoples. For example, in the New York Evening Post, on 18, in 1875, Gage writes an article called The Remnant of the Five Nations. But she, in this article, she calls the United States the quote unquote successor of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So she's, ba she's basically calling the United States a country that's replacing indigenous people. And she doesn't see a problem with framing it that way. Hmm. And um, she also speaks of Dr. Peter Wilson, as a, quote, civilized chief. So she's making distinctions between civilized and uncivilized um, Native Americans. And um, in Woman, Church, and State, which is a really significant work that Gage wrote in 1893, she talks about indigenous people and the matriarchate largely in the past tense. So she's thinking of Native Americans as something that are part of history. They're kind of fading out. They're not something that's really present and alive and involved in the real world today. She speaks of them in the past tense. And um, in 1878, in her personal newspaper, The National Citizen and Ballot Box, she also writes an article on Indian citizenship. And um, she protests the forced the forcing of U.S. citizenship on Native Americans, which would entail that they would also be able to vote in U.S. elections. Um, but she protests that because she contrasts it with the federal government not giving women the uh, right to vote. So she's like, well, how come women who want to be able to vote aren't allowed to, mm -hmm. but Native Americans who don't want to be able to vote are being forced to? And then she proceeds to um, say, quote, can women's political degradation reach much lower depth? She, educated, enlightened, Christian, in vain, begs for the crumbs cast contemptuously aside by savages. Wow. Unquote. So even though she did interact with the local indigenous tribes and she was adopted honorarily into the Mohawk Nation, she really exhibits a lot of these attitudes that many white people or settler Americans had of Native Americans at the time, which is that they ultimately um, are inferior in some way. They're savages or they need to assimilate. Or um, I think the main thing that she uses indigenous people for it's not so much assimilation because she's talking about, hey, we shouldn't force them to be citizens, but she's using them to try to make a point or an agenda for women's suffrage. Right. And this is a theme that starts to come up a lot later in the 19th century and in the 20th century is that Americans like to use Native American culture, um, indigenous culture as a form of authenticity. Like, oh, um, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy allowed women to um, counsel with the chiefs to inform them on how should we make political decisions and things like that. And, and women were able to depose chiefs that 
they didn't like. Therefore, um, women have more rights. Therefore, women in American society should have more rights because Native American people did. And that makes us feel more like cool, quote unquote. They obviously didn't use the word cool back then. But I mean, today you see it a lot in, I think, climate change issues and environmentalism, where people like to say that indigenous societies are more in touch with the earth and we need to live more like indigenous people. Um, and uh, there are some scholars and philosophers like uh, Kyle White, who's Potawatomi, who's written about this. And he's like, people who are trying to use um, indigenous culture to justify what they're doing are negating the fact that their ancestors and their culture, American ancestry and culture, has destroyed so much and has just tried to take land initially and deny any value in indigenous culture. But then once they have access to land, once they have access to resources, then they turn it around and go, oh no, look what we did. Well, indigenous people had some cool stuff, so why don't we try and use that so that we can almost cleanse our guilt kind of by like shifting the narrative and that really started in 1881 with Helen Hunt Jackson's The Century of Dishonor when she um, really tries to make a case that the United States really mistreated Native Americans. They broke a lot of treaties and, and tries to make this move for more sympathy towards Native Americans instead of like, oh, they're horrible savages. Mm -hmm. It really shifts that narrative towards more sympathy. But I mean, is Matilda Jocelyn Gage uh, more on the sympathy side? Is she more on the side of seeing natives as savages? Because she does call them savages. Um, yeah. I don't know the absolute answer to that question. Um, there's a lot of material and archives and stuff that people haven't looked into about what Gage may or may not have thought about indigenous people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting that like her son-in-law, L. Frank Baum, uh, who wrote Wizard of Oz, and um, apparently she, Gage, inspired his character, Dorothy. He had some really um, interesting things to say about Native Americans in his uh, paper, The Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer. In 1891, he wrote, our only, quote, our only safety depends upon the total extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, Follow it, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth, unquote. Wow. So that's her son-in-law. But what kind of relationship did they have? Are there maybe some letters between them? Like what kind of conversations maybe did they have about their viewpoints on indigenous people? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't think we really know that right now because there's research that hasn't been done. But I mean, did Gage agree with what her son-in-law is saying? Um in 1876, when she went to the Centennial Exposition, I believe it was in Chicago or New York, um, she ran across some indigenous artifacts. So this uh, Centennial Expo Exposition was celebrating 100 years of the United States existence. And so they had, she wrote a letter to her son Clarkson about it. And she said there were Arizona cliff house models there's these wooden, massive wooden figures from the Pacific Northwest. All of these are indigenous artifacts. Mm -hmm. And um, she doesn't find a problem with the way these things are portrayed in the exposition. But she does find a problem with the way that women are not present in the exposition. The contributions of women to United States society and history. She writes protest letters to local papers about it. But she doesn't protest anything about um these indigenous people, um, because in these expositions, they would portray indigenous people in a very consumeristic, romanticized way of like dying races being replaced by manifest destiny. Look, the, we're celebrating a hundred years of America. This is what we're replacing, this old heritage. And it's kind of very like romanticized. Yeah. And she just passively kind of accepted it that way. And like, mm -hmm. did she just kind of go with the zeitgeist of the time and just like, oh, Native Americans are disappearing and maybe we can take some cool pointers from their society or culture, but ultimately we don't really care about them as people um, is something that I wonder about with Gage. That is very interesting and 
maybe someone will hear this and want to dive more into that and maybe we'll get more information and get those questions answered. Hopefully that would be nice. Um, I know that you wanted to um, bring up some anti-Indigenous quotes. Yes, there are some other suffragists um, from the 20th century, actually, before the 19th Amendment passed. Okay. While well, they were in their early years fighting to get women the right to vote. Um, Carrie Chapman Catt, she was a president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and so was Anna Howard Shaw. And they both have some interesting quotes I wanted to share with you people. Um, in the newspaper The Crisis in 1916, Cat wrote, quote, during the Civil War, there was an uprising of the Sioux Indians. These Indians instituted one of the cruelest and most savage massacres in our history. They committed atrocities upon women, so indescribably indecent that they were never recorded in ordinary history. In 1916, I am reliably informed that there are 5,000 Sioux voters in the state of South Dakota and that they may prove the balance of power in November to decide whether women who have borne the burdens of pioneer life shall be permitted to vote. How much the schools have taught them of human liberty within the last quarter of a century, I do not know, but I opine that they will make congenial allies to the antis, unquote. So she's basically saying she thinks these Sioux men who have the right to vote in South Dakota will vote against women's suffrage. So she's saying uh, kind of the opposite of what um, I think we got from the Wagner anthology about, oh, they think Native Americans are always on the side of women's rights and we're going to use them to like bolster our cause. And here's Carrie Chapman Katz saying, no, we don't want Native Americans to be participating in this vote because they're anti-women. So it's a totally different perspective. Yeah. And um, similarly, Anna, Anna Howard Shaw wrote, or, or gave in a presidential address around 1904, 1905 to the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, she's talking about Sacagawea, who helped Lewis and Clark in their Pacific expedition. Mm -hmm. Quote, may we, the daughters of an alien race who slew your people and usurped your country, learn the lessons of calm endurance, of patient persistence, and unfaltering courage exemplified in your life in our efforts to lead men to the past of justice, unquote. So she's basically saying, hey, Native Americans, indigenous people, um, we, we uh, your European people who came over the waters, uh, we kind of wrongfully and unjustly took your land from you, but that's just the way it happened. And in the meantime, we're gonna learn from your example of endurance, persistence, and courage wow. to uh, get women the right to vote. So it's kind of an anti-indigenous thing to say. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, uh, I wanted to end with a quote from a historian, cultural critic, Philip J. Deloria, who's the son of Vine Deloria. And Vine Deloria is a really kind of big name in indigenous literature. Okay. And um, Philip Deloria wrote, in 1998, his PhD dissertation called Playing Indian. It's in a book called Playing Indian. He's basically writing about uh, white people or American settlers who dress up in costume as Indians and and um, try to get a sense of American identity through imitating indigenous culture. And he says, quote, their land safely secured, Americans were able to downplay the Jacksonian savage, which is a reference to Andrew Jackson, who really thought of natives as savages. Um, and turned to guilt-cleansing criticism of the very policies that had emptied the landscape, unquote. So he's saying that this whole shift towards valuing indigenous culture as something to memorialize, as something to admire, as something to imitate, doesn't really happen until Americans have access to the land. Once they have access to the land, once they have access to those resources, then they they don't have to be in war anymore. They don't have to be portraying Native Americans as savages who need to be destroyed because they're not using the land correctly. They're going to kill people. It's like, no, they're out of the way now. We have what we want. So now we can turn to 
let's use, um, let's create the Indian in the image of our own needs, which is a quote from Alan Track and Bert Shades of Hiawatha. Create the Indian in the image of our own needs. And I think that a lot of the suffragists, like Matilda Jocelyn Gage, or maybe that's what they were doing, they were trying to create indigenous people in the image of their own needs. Um, and pointing out, oh, look, women have uh, rights in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, therefore we should too. But at the end of the day, they didn't really care if those women and that Haudenosaunee Confederacy had rights. They just wanted to use them as an example to put white men to shame. Look at these savages, how they let their women do stuff and you won't let us? How dare you? That's kind of what it comes down to, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And I know that that's something that I'm going to want to look more into because um, going into the program, the study away program, I didn't know about that for, you know, I knew that Native Americans were, were talked about, but I thought they were working alongside. And then it wasn't until the program that I realized maybe not, they were just using to win. They didn't really care about the women or the Native American, or yeah, Native American community. So well, thank you so much for sharing. That was very informative. Um, so now we have Ever, she has joined us. <laughs> Hello, she's made it. Um, what was something that you wanted to discuss about the program? What did you take away from it? And what did you think was most interesting? There were so many takeaways and everything was interesting. And I just left with uh, you know as many questions as it came with all leading me to you know, different rabbit holes. I think that's my favorite part about history is mm -hmm. just like always wondering and looking towards the next question. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I did take away from the study away program um, was, was that I wanted to know more about um, Frederick Douglass and his family life. I was really interested in our experience at Mount Hope Cemetery. When I was there, we found out that, I mean, I don't know if y'all had been aware before that he had remarried. Did y'all, were y'all familiar with that? Before? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Never paid attention to anybody's love life in the history books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I, you know, I really became fascinated with Frederick Douglass when I first took my U.S. history course. When I learned about his story, I just had a new perspective on U.S. history because mm -hmm. it, it was not something that gets taught frequently in the public schools here in the United States. So I thought that it was such an amazing story and I really wanted to learn more about him. And, and that's where I started my journey with history was like with Frederick Douglass. So oh. yeah, and so when, it was before I was even a history major, I had no mm -hmm. clue that this is anything I wanted to pursue. And so when I realized that US history was so much more than it, the way that the public schools had framed it, it um, you know, changed my perspective. So to be again in a space like honoring these historical actors at their great sites, it was eye-opening to realize like, oh, there's so much more to this story that people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about love lives or women and, and how they might impact um, historical actors like Frederick Douglass. Yeah. So whenever I, I don't know, it was a whole experience. I can't even really remember the days that we were at specific places that mm -hmm. led me to all of these takeaways. But still, I just felt left with more questions, and I feel that I have a lot of research to do on it. Mm -hmm. So I can speak to my experiences on the trip, but not yes. much more than that. Um, when we were at Mount Hope Cemeteries, when we found out, or when I found out that um, that his sons had left a, a tomb stone marker for Frederick Douglass, but that also was it. Helen Pitts's family had left one for him as well, I, or I guess it would have been her. Helen Pitts, Frederick Douglass' second wife. So I think it was it was the second wife. Could that yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um so Anna Marie Douglas is on one side, Frederick Douglass is in the middle, mm -hmm. and then has a second tombstone behind him left by Anna Marie Douglas and Frederick Douglass' children, and then has Helen Pitts to the right of him, if that's that sounds right. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And so I wanted to look into it a little bit more because we had learned 
some of the feelings and sentiments that Susan had towards the Douglas family when we're at Susan B. Anthony's house. Mm -hmm. And that was in Rochester, right? I, I believe so. I'm not quite sure. Uh, so yes, Rochester. And I think it was, it was, uh, it was there that we learned that I learned that, uh, the Douglas family came over every Sunday. And that was something that was really cherished to Susan B. Anthony. Mm -hmm. And so like, I think we had mentioned that we had, you know, pre pre conceived notions of what Susan B. Anthony meant as a historical actor yeah, and started to try to consider just who she was as just a person instead of, you know, putting so much pressure on her to, to be a, a role model, you know? Yeah. Um, and so when I found out that she was in close relations and really cherished these every, you know, Sunday, these, I think it's dinners kind of events like that, that she was having with the Douglas family. It made me wonder how close she was in the relationship that she had with Frederick Douglass's first wife, Anna Marie Douglas. And I'm wondering if Susan B. Anthony was fighting with Frederick Douglass about, you know, the 15th Amendment on this point because he, she wanted women to be included. And I wonder if that had anything to do with this relationship with his wife. Was she fighting for Anna Marie Douglas's rights to go? I don't know the answer, but I wonder about it. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things that Anna Marie Douglas had contributed to Frederick Douglass that I thought was really fascinating that I, I learned after the trip was that Anna Marie Douglas was taking care of the children and the home life of Frederick Douglass during, you know, the North Star. And that was really important. But in addition to that, in in the process of getting to the North Star, of course, she, she had to aid Frederick Douglass in finding freedom. And she was able to do that by hand sewing the costume that he used to find freedom. And I, I just thought that that was so important to his story and is often overlooked. Um, but it was, I kind of got off track again, but <laughs> Helen uh, Pitts, his second wife, when we were at Susan B. Anthony's house is when I learned that supposedly, apparently, mm -hmm. according to the person who was giving us the tour, mm -hmm. she had learned that uh, that Susan B. Anthony, in regards to Frederick Douglass marrying a second time, mm -hmm. felt that Helen Pitts wasn't good enough for him. And so I wonder, you know, again, is that tied to the relationship that she had with Anna Marie Douglas, or is it, you know, means nothing? I'm not sure, but I think it's really interesting to consider that there might be more uh, perspectives and we understand. That is very interesting. And I know you keep talking about um, the North Star. Just to clarify for the listeners, what is symbolic of the North Star? What does that mean? It was a really important um, abolition newspaper written by Frederick Douglass uh, and those deadlines to get them out. I don't think that he missed any of them. I think I, I could be mistaken, but from what I remember, that's, mm -hmm. it was a really important and um, it's called the North Star because it's, it's guiding the community who might be also following in Frederick Douglass's footsteps and looking for freedom, searching for that. Um, and, and I think that the, that gave a, a really important space for the community to express their needs and their feelings mm -hmm. and um, rep have representation. Okay. Well, that is definitely interesting and I liked how you continued your research even after the program um, and I hope that you know you you can come back and tell us a little bit more I think you know Frederick Doug Douglas is definitely somebody that's on my list to research a little bit more of because it wasn't until the program that I became more interested in him I don't know I just kind of felt like in in grade school like in elementary we didn't learn much about these people it was just kind of like brushed over you know, like, for example, Harriet Tubman, I didn't know she was a war hero. You know, all I knew was that she was a runaway slave and, you know, she helped to guide the slaves to freedom. But, um, you know, learning more about Frederick Douglass and about Susan B. Anthony and about Matilda Johnson Gage, like, these are all fascinating people that I, I want to dig my hands into, you know. So thank you all so much for for sharing. Um I did want to, I have a deck of cards. It's called Votes for Women. And it's a deck of cards that I want to pull from. Let me grab it real fast. Okay, so I'm shuffling a deck and you can just pick one card. 
Um, each card has a different suffrages on it. And I took out the ones that are mostly known um, because I want to give us a chance to, uh, you know, learn about somebody new. Maybe somebody we don't know that was a suffragist. So, alrighty. Okay, who wants to go first? What's funny, I got this lady because as, as I saw the deck in your hands, I know I saw her name and I'm like, oh, that lady's the atheist lady. She's named Ernestine Rhodes. Oh. She was like, um, she wrote some atheist like publications and was very kind of uh, uh, iconoclastic towards the church and religion and things like that. Interesting. Um, so just read the mm -hmm. entire thing. Okay. Ernestine Rose, born January 13th, 1810, died August 4th, 1892. Ernestine Rose was born in Pietrakov, Poland. I do not know if I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> in 1810, she was a women's rights activist and free thinker. The only daughter of a rabbi, she was raised Jewish, but frequently questioned her father's conservative religious views, including his unequal treatment of women. When she was 16 years old, her father attempted to marry her to a much older man. The young Rose successfully argued in court that this was unjust and soon after left Poland. Rose moved around Europe for the next 10 years, becoming involved with socialist and social reform movements before settling in New York City with William Rose, a husband whom she chose. She became involved with the women's rights movement there and befriended Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She worked as a lecturer and organizer. Rose was especially invested in the cause of married women's equality, fighting for property rights and less strict divorce laws. Though she had been an abolitionist after the Civil War, she sided with Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and helped form the National Women's Suffrage Association, which disapproved of the 15th Amendment giving Black men, but not white women, the right to vote. A powerful lecturer, Rose was often criticized for her open atheism and direct questioning of religion. At times, she was also attacked by anti-Semites for her background as an immigrant and Jewish woman. She moved back to England in 1869, working and lecturing there for the next several years. She died in 1892 at age 82. Wow. I didn't mean for you to read a book. I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's definitely cool. I haven't heard of, um, I haven't heard of her, but you have. Yes, they had a book on. It was like women free thinkers, and it was all these like snippets and chapters and essays from the night from the 18th century into the 20th century from women who were usually atheists or agnostics, and she was one of the people I remember reading. Awesome. Alrighty, ever your card? Okay, so I pulled Nellie Griswold Francis. Ah, okay. From November, she was born November 7th, 1874, and died December 13, 1969. She was born in Nashville, Tennessee in 1874. She was a suffragist, civil rights activist, and community organizer. Her family moved to St. Paul, Minnesota in 1883. The only Black student in her class, she gave a speech at her high school graduation in 1891 about the need for equal rights for African Americans. In 1914, Frances resigned from her job at publishing company to become a full-time activist. During her career in Minnesota, she joined or founded over a dozen civic organizations. She served as the first president of the Every Woman Suffrage Club, a black woman suffrage organization that became known as the Every Woman Progressive Council after the ratification of the 19th Amendment. She also wrote an anti-lynching bill that became a Minnesota law in 1921. Frances moved to Monrovia, Liberia when her diplomat husband, William, in 1927, um, with her, her diplomat husband. When he died there two years later, Frances moved back to her home state of Tennessee. She died in 1969 at age 95. Wow. Awesome. I didn't even know about that organization. We learned something new. Cool. A vanguard right there. Yeah. yeah. Just right up your alley working for Sam Cam. Yes. yes. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Thank you guys again. This was fun. I hope that we can do it again and keep learning more about Frederick Douglass and the Haudenosaunee. Yes. Yeah. So until then.
Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Well, listeners, that concludes our episode for today. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep loving history and stay curious.